They call me Dr. Go. I am Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of AI at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And today, I'm in Munich, Germany. Home to one and a half million people, Munich is famous for everything from BMW to beer to breathtaking architecture and festive markets. The Bavarian capital is the beating heart of Germany's automobile industry. Over 50,000 of its residents work in automotive engineering and to date, Munich allocated around 30 million euros to boost electric vehicles and infrastructure for them. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jerome Baudry. I am a professor at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Our mission is to use uh, uh, computational resources to accelerate the discovery of uh, drugs that will be useful and efficient against the COVID-19 virus. On the one hand, there is this uh, terrible crisis, and on the other hand, there is this uh, uh, absolutely unique and rare global effort to fight it, and that I think is a, is a very positive thing. I am working with the uh, Cray HPE machine called Sentinel. This machine is so amazing that it can actually mimic the screening of hundreds of thousands, almost millions of chemicals a day. What would take weeks, if not months or years, we can do in a matter of a few days. And it's really the key to accelerating the discovery of new drugs, new pharmaceuticals. We're all in this together. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And I'm so pleased to be here to interview Dr. Jerome Baudry of the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Hello, Dr. Gu. I'm very happy to be meeting with you here uh, in Lynn today. I have a lot of questions for you as well, and I'm looking forward to this conversation between us. Yes, yes, and, and I've got lots of COVID-19 and computational science questions lined up for you too, Jerome. Yeah, well, so let, let's interview each other then. Huh? Absolutely, let's do that. Let's interview each other. I've got many questions for you, and um, uh, I, we have a lot in common, and yet a lot of things we are, uh, addressing from a different point of view. So I'm very much yeah. looking forward to your ideas and insights. Yeah, especially now, you know, uh, with COVID-19, many of us will ha have to pivot a lot of our research and development work yeah, to address uh, the most uh, current issues. Um, I, I watch uh, your video and, and have seen that uh, you're very much focused on drug discovery using supercomputing, yeah, the, the Sentinel book you did. I'm, I'm very um, excited about that, you know, and, and can tell us a bit more about how that works, yeah. Yes, I'll be happy to. In fact, I watched your video as well on manufacturing, and it's actually quite surprisingly close what we do yeah. with uh, drugs, with what other people do with planes or cars or assembly lanes, uh, you know. We are calculating forces on molecules when on drug candidates when they hit parts of the viruses. And we essentially try to identify what small molecules will hit the viruses or its components the hardest to mess with its function in a way. And that's not very different from what you're doing, what you are describing people in the industry or in the transportation industry are doing. So that's our problem, so to speak, is to um, deal with a lot of small molecules calculating a lot of forces. That's not our main problem. Our main problem is to make intelligent choices about what to calculate, uh, what kind of data should we incorporate in our calculations, and what kind of data should we give to the people who are going to do the testing. Um, and that's really something I would like you to, 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 to help us understand better. How do you see artificial intelligence helping us putting our hands on the right data to start with in order to produce the right data to end up with? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and it is a question that uh, we've been pondering in our strategy as a company a lot recently. Because more and more now we realize that uh, the data is being generated at the far out edge. By edge, I mean you know, something that's outside of the cloud and data center, right? Uh, like for example, the more recent uh, COVID-19 uh, work uh, doing a lot of uh, cryo-electron microscope work, right, to, to try and get high-resolution pictures of the virus. 
um, and, and at different angles. So creating lots of movies under electron microscope to try and create a 3D model uh, of, of the virus. Right? Uh, and, and we realized that's the edge, right? Because that's where the microscope is away from the data center and massive amounts of data is generated, terabytes and terabytes of data per day generated. And we had to develop means, right? A workflow means to get that data off the microscope and uh, uh, provide pre-processing and processing so that they can achieve results without delay. So uh, we learned quite a few lessons there, right? Uh, especially trying to get the edge to be more intelligent to deal with the onslaught of data coming in uh, from, from these devices. That's fantastic that you're saying that and that you're using this very example of cryo-EM because that's the kind of data that feeds our computations. Uh, and indeed, we have found that it is very, very difficult to uh, get the right cryo-EM data to us. Now, we've been working with an HP supercomputer Sentinel, as you may know, for our uh, COVID-19 work. So we have a lot of computational power, but we would be even faster and better, frankly, if we knew what kind of cryo-EM data to focus on. In fact, most of our discussions are based on not so much how to compute the forces on the molecules, which we do quite well on an HP supercomputer. But again, what prior OEM three-dimensional structure should we look at? And it's becoming almost a bottleneck. Have access to some data. And we spend a lot of time. Do you envision a point where AI will be able to help us to make this kind of code almost live, or at least as close to live as possible, as the data comes from the age, how to take it and, and, and not triage it, but prioritize it for the best possible computations on supercomputers? Well, what, what, a, what a visionary uh, uh, question and, and desire, right? That's exactly uh, the vision uh, we have, right? Uh, of course, the, the ultimate vision, you aim for the, for the best, and that would be a real-time stream of processed data coming off the microscope, straight, uh, providing you what you need, right? We are not there. Uh, before this, we are far from there, right? Uh, but that's the aim, the ability to push more and more intelligence forward so that by the time the data reaches you, it is what you need, right, without any further processing. And a lot of AI is applied there, um, particularly in cryo-EM where they do particle picking. Right? They do a lot of uh, uh, active, uh, pictures and movies of, of the virus. And then what they do is they, they rotate the virus a little bit. Right? Uh, yeah. And what they do is then to try and figure out in all the different images in the movies, to try and pick uh, the particles in there. And uh, this is very much image, image processing that AI is very good at. So many different stages uh, application is made. The key thing is to deal with the data that's flowing at this, at this speed and to get the data to you in the right form uh, that uh, in, in time. That so yes, uh, uh, that's the desire, right? It, uh, will be a, it will be a game changer, really. Uh -huh. We'll be able to get things in a matter of weeks instead of a matter of years to the uh, colleagues who will be doing the, uh, the testing. If the AI can help me learn from a calculation that didn't exactly turn out the way we want it to be, that would be very very helpful uh, i can see that i can i can envision ai being able to uh, uh live ai to be able to really revolutionize all the process not only from drug discovery but all the way to the clinical to the patient to the hospital well that, that that's that's a great point you know, in fact I, I caught on to your term live ai that's that's actually uh what we are trying to achieve although I have not used that term before. Perhaps I'll borrow it for next time. Oh, please, by all means. <laughs> you see, uh, uh, yes, uh, we, we have done, uh, been doing also recent work on gene expression data. So a vaccine, a uh, clinical trial, they, they, have the blood, they get the blood from the volunteers after the first day, and then to, to, to run very, very fast AI analytics on the uh, gene expression data, the, the, uh, the one, the, the transcription data before translation to amino acid. The transcription data is enormous. We're talking 30,000, 60,000 different items, right? uh, transcripts. And how to use that high, high dimensional data to predict on day one whether this volunteer will get an, an adverse event or will have a good antibody outcome right? uh, for efficacy. So yes, how, how to do it so quickly right? uh, to, to get the blood, go through an assay, right? get the transcript, and then run the analytics and, and AI to produce an, uh, an outcome. So that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. Yeah?
Yes, I always emphasize that, you know, uh, ultimately the doctor makes that decision. Yes, you know, the yes, AI, AI only, only um, as, uh, su suggests based on the data, this is the likely outcome based on all the previous data that the machine has learned from. Oh, I agree. We wouldn't want a machine to decide the fate of a patient, but to assist the doctor or nurse in making the decision, that would be invaluable. And are you aware of any kind of industry that already is using this kind of uh, live AI? And then, or is there anything in, I don't know, in sport or, or, or uh, crowd control? Or is there any kind of industry? I would be curious to see who is ahead of us in terms of making this kind of... Uh, minute-based decisions using AI. Yes, yes. Uh, in, in, in fact, uh, this, this is a very pertinent question. We, uh, as, as, uh, in, in fact, uh, you know, COVID-19, lots of effort uh, working on it, right? But now uh, industries and in different countries are starting to work on returning to work, right? Returning to the offices, uh, returning to the factories, returning to the manufacturing plants, but yet, uh, uh, you know, the employers need to reassure the employees that things are, uh, uh, appropriate measures are taken for safety, but yet maintain privacy, right? So uh, our Aruba organization actually uh, developed a solution called uh, contact location tra tracing inside buildings, inside factories, right? Uh, why, why they built this uh, and, and needed a lot of machine learning methods in there uh, to do very, very, uh, well, as you say, live AI, right? Uh, to, to, to offer uh, a solution. Well, let, let me describe the problem. The problem is um, um, in, in certain countries uh, and, and certain states, certain cities where regulations require that if someone is ill, right, um, you actually have to go in and disinfect uh, the area mm -hmm. the ill person has been to. It's a requirement. But if you don't know precisely where the ill person has been to, you actually disinfect the whole factory. And if you have that, if you do that, you know, it becomes impractical and cost prohibitive for the company to keep operating uh, profitably. So what, what they are doing uh, today with Aruba is that they carry this uh, Bluetooth low energy tag, which is a quarter size, right? Um, the reason they do that is so that they abstract the tag from the person. And then, to, uh, and then this, the system tracks uh, you know, everybody, all the employees, we have one uh, company that has 10,000 employees, right? Uh, tracks everybody with the tag. Uh, and if there is a person ill, uh, immediately uh, a floor plan is brought up with hotspots. And then uh, you just targeted the cleaning services there. And the same thing, contact uh, tracing is also produced uh, automatically. You could say uh, anybody that is come in contact with this person uh, within two meters, uh, and uh, more than 15 minutes, right? right. Uh, the, it comes out the list. And, and we, uh, privacy is our, our focus here. Uh, there's a separation between the tech and the person and only restricted people are allowed to see the association. And then to, uh, uh, things like uh, washrooms and all that are not tracked here. Yeah. So yes, um, uh, uh, live AI, trying to make very, very quick decisions, right? Because this affects people. Another question I have for you, if you have a minute actually, and it has to do with the same thing. So, and it's more a question about hardware, about the computer architecture, if I may. We are having, we're spending a lot of time computing on number crunching giant machines, like Sentinel, for instance, which is a dream to use, but it's very good at something. But then we kind of also spend a lot of time moving back and forth of data from clouds, from storage, from AI processing the computing cycles back and forth, back and forth, do you envision an architecture that would kind of combine the hardware needed for a massively parallel calculations that kind of we are doing, and also very large storage, fast IO to be more AI friendly, so to speak. Mm. Do you see on the horizon some kind of, a, I would say universal machine, maybe it's too big a term, too ambitious a term, but something that plan the AI ahead in terms of uh, passing the data to the massively parallel side. Yeah, does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Uh, and and uh, you ask it, I know, because it is a tough problem to solve. Yeah. You know, uh, as we always say, uh, uh, computation, right, uh, is growing uh, capability uh, enormously. But, uh, you know, um, uh, bandwidth you have to pay for, latency you sweat for, right? <laughs> right? That's so, very good. <laughs> right? So, um, uh, moving data is ultimately going to be the problem. It um, is. 
Yeah, and, and we move the data a lot of times, right? You, you, you Dude, first- Back uh, and forth all the time. Back and forth, back and forth. From the edge, you pre that's why we try to pre-process it, you know, before you put it in uh, storage, yeah. But then once it arrives in storage, you move it to memory to do some work and bring it back. You move it to memory again, right? And then uh, that's for HPC. And then uh, you, you put it in, back into storage and then the AI comes in, you, you do the learning uh, the other way around also. So lots of back and forth, right? So tough problem to solve, uh, but more and more, uh, we are looking at uh, a new architecture, right? Currently, this architecture was built for the AI side first, but we're now looking at see how we can expand that. Um, and this is, uh, that, that's the reason why we announced uh, HPE Esmeral Data Fabric. Yeah, uh, what, what it does is that uh, it, it takes care of the data all the way uh, from the edge point of view. The minute it is ingested at the edge, it is incorporated into global namespace. So that uh, eventually where the data arrive, lands at geographically, one, or lands at uh, uh, temperature, hot data, warm data, or cold data, the, regardless of eventually where it end, lands at, this data fabric uh, tracks everything from in a global namespace in a unified way. So that's the first step. So that data is not seen as uh, in different places, different pieces. It is a unified view of all the data, the minute, the instant the is tested from the edge. Yeah. I think it's I, important that we communicate that AI and super computing is a force for good. You know, a lot of sci-fi movies, unfortunately, showcase some psychotic computers or, or teams of evil scientists who want to take over the world. But how can we communicate better that it's a, a tool for a change, a tool for good? You know? So key differences, uh, I always point out is that uh, at least we have still judgment relative to the machine. And part of the reason we still have judgment is because uh, our brain, uh, you know, a logical center is automatically connected to our emotional center. So Whatever our logic say is tempered by emotion and whatever our emotion wants to, act, wants to do, right, is tempered by our logic, right? Um, but an AI machine is, uh, many call them uh, artificial specific intelligence. They are just focused on that decision making and uh, are not connected to other, in, well, uh, more uh, culturally sensitive or emotionally uh, sensitive type uh, networks. They are focused networks, yeah. Although there are people trying to build them, right? That's just part of the reason why with judgment, I always use the phrase, right? Uh, what's correct is not always the right thing to do. There is a difference, right? Uh, we need to be there to be the last judge of what's right here, right? Uh, big, yeah. So that's just one of the, the big thing. The other, one, the other one I bring up is that uh, humans are, uh, are, are different from machines, uh, generally in a sense that we are highly subtractive. We, 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 we filter. Right. Well, machine is highly accumulative today. So an AI machine, they accumulate, you know, uh, bring in a lots of data and tune the network. But uh, our, our brains, a few people realize we've been working with uh, uh, brain researchers uh, in, in our work. Right? Um, uh, between three and 30 years old, our brain actually goes through a pruning process of our connections. So, you know, for, for for those of us uh, like me, after 30, uh, it's done, right? <laughs> Where didn't you reach my age? Keep the, keep the brain active because it, it prunes away connections you don't use. Yeah, yeah. To try and conserve energy, right? You know, I always say, you know, uh, to remind our engineers about this point about pruning is because of energy efficiency, right? A slice of pizza drives our brain for three hours. That's right. <laughs> That's why, you know, sometimes when I get, need to get my engineers to work longer, I just offer them pizza, right? three more hours. Pizza is right? a universal solution to all our problems, <laughs> absolutely. This is yeah. wonderful, indeed, indeed. There is always a need for a human consciousness. Indeed. It's not just a logic. It's not like uh, Mr. Spock in Star Trek, who always speaks about logic, but forgets the humanity aspect of it, I think. So. Yes, yes. The, the, the connection between the, you know, the... the the logic centers and the emotional the centers. Emotional right? center, you said it yeah, very but, well. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the thing is, uh, re sleep researchers are saying that uh, when you don't get enough uh, RAM sleep, this connection is uh, weakened. Therefore, therefore, your decision making gets affected if you don't get enough sleep. So I was thinking, you know, uh, you know people do uh, uh, alcohol tests, breathalyzer tests before they're allowed to operate uh, uh, sensitive uh, or make sensitive decisions. Perhaps in the future, you have to check whether you have enough REM sleep before you... It is. Um, this COVID-19 crisis is obviously a, a dramatic, and I wish it never happened. But I, I 
there is something that I never experienced before is how people are talking to each other. People like you and me, we have a lot in common, but I hear more about uh, uh, the industry uh, outside of my field. And uh, I talk a lot to people like cryo -EM people or gene expiration people. I would have gotten the data before and process it. Now we have a dialogue across the board in all aspects of industry, science, and, and, and society. And I think that could be uh, uh, something wonderful that we should keep after we finally fix this COVID crisis. Yes, crisis. yes, yes. That's, that's a great point. Uh, in fact, uh, it's something that I've been thinking about, right, for employees. You know, things have changed uh, because of COVID-19, but very likely the change will continue, yeah, right? Uh, so even though, yes, yes, because there are a few positive outcomes. Yes. Well, COVID-19 is a tough outcome, but... Uh, there are few positive uh, side of things uh, like uh, communicating in this way Absolutely. effectively. Yes. So, so we were part of the consortium that developed a natural language processing system, an AI system that would uh, allow you, uh, scientists to do, I, I can send you the link to that website, uh, to allow you to do a query, uh, you know, so say, uh, tell me the uh, latest on the binding energy between uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus spike protein and the ACE2 receptor. Right, you, and then you will, you will, it will give you a list of ten answers, yeah, and and give you a link to the papers that say they say those answers. If you key that in today to the NLP, you see three fifteen points minus fifteen point seven uh, kcal per mole, which is the right. I think the, the general consensus answer, and you see a few that are highly out of out of uh, range, right? And then when you go further, you realize those are the earlier papers. So I, I think this NLP system will be useful. Uh, I've used that very, I have, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I've, I'm enthusiastic about it because I have used that and it's a game changer indeed. It is amazing indeed. Many times by using this kind of uh, intelligent conceptual uh, analysis of the literature that indeed you guys are developing, I have found um, connections between facts or between clinical or pharmaceutical aspects of COVID-19 that I wasn't really aware of. So oh. it's, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a tool for creativity as well. You know, I find it, uh, it builds something. It just doesn't analyze what has been done, but it creates the, the connections. It creates a network of knowledge and intelligence. Uh, that's why, you know, three to 30 years old, uh, when it stops pruning, right? <laughs> I know, I know. And they, but our children are amazing in that respect. They yeah. see scenes that we don't see anymore. They make connections that we don't necessarily think of because we are used to think a certain way. And, and the eyes of a child are, 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 are bringing always something new, which I think is what AI could potentially bring here. Mm. So, so, so look, this is fascinating, really. Yes, um, yes. Uh, difference between filtering, subtractive, and the machine being accumulative. That's why I believe you know, the two working together can have uh, a stronger outcome if used properly. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think that's how AI will be a force for good indeed. Help us see things that we would have missed that could end up, that would end up being very important. Well, I, we are very interested in our, in our quest for uh, drug discovery against COVID-19. We have been quite successful so far. We have accelerated the process by, by, by an order of magnitude. So we're having... Wow molecules that are being tested against the virus. Otherwise, it would have taken maybe three or four years to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. first thing, it's a, uh, we have been very fast, but we are very interested in natural products, that, that chemicals that come from plants, essentially. We found a way to mine, I don't want to say exploit, but leverage the knowledge of hundreds of years of, of people documenting in a very historical way uh, uh, what plants do against what diseases in different parts of the world. You know. So that, that really has been a, not only very useful in our work, but a, a, a fantastic uh, bridge to our common human history, basically. And second, yes, plants have chemicals. And uh, of course, we have chemicals. Every living cell has chemicals. The chemicals that are in plants um, uh, have been fine-tuned by evolution to actually have some biological function. They are not there just to look good. They have a role in the cell. And um, if we're trying to come with a new drug from scratch, which is also something we want to do, of course, then we have to engineer a function that evolution has already found a solution for in plants. So in a way, it's also artificial intelligence. You know, uh, uh, We have natural solutions to our problems. 
why don't we try to find them and see if they work in ourselves? You know, we don't yep. necessarily have to reinvent the wheel each time. Hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Hundreds of millions yeah. of years. Many iterations. Yes, and in millions of different plants with all kind of chemical diversity. So we have a lot of data at our disposal here. If only we find the right way to analyze them and bring them to our supercomputers, then we will, we will really leverage uh, this, this uh, humongous amount of knowledge. Instead of having to reinvent a wheel each time we want to take our car, we'll find that there are cars with wheels already that we should be borrowing instead of uh, so building see. one each time. You know, most of the keys are out there. If we can find them, they are at our disposal. Yeah, nature has done the work after hundreds of millions of years. Yes, right? uh, it took a lot our of job time. Is, is to figure out which is it. Which is it? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Hence the importance of biodiversity. Yeah, I think this is related to the knowledge graph, right? Where Absolutely. you have, uh, yes, uh, two objects and then yes. and, and the linking uh, parameter, right? And then you have hundreds of millions of these, right? Uh, Absolutely. They are a chemical to the an outcome uh, and the link to it, right? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Absolutely the kind of things we're pursuing very much so. Absolutely. Not only only building the graph, but building the dynamics of the graph, you know, in the ah. future. Um, if you eat too much uh, creme brulee, or if you don't run enough, or if you sleep well, then your cells will have different connections on this graph of knowledge. It will interact with that molecule in a different way than if you had more sleep or didn't eat that much creme brulee or, uh, or exercised a bit more, you know. So, so insightful, uh, Dr. Baudry. Yeah, um, your, your, your span of knowledge right, uh, impressed me, and, and uh, it's such a fascinating uh, talking to you, right? And, I appreciate and probably very next much. time when we get together, we'll, we'll have a bit of creme brulee together. Oh, uh, yes. Let's find out scientifically what it does. We have to do double blind and try three times to make sure we got the right statistics. Three phases, three Absolutely. clinical trial phases, right? It's been a pleasure talking to you. I like, I like we agreed, you know, this for all the COVID-19 problems, the way that people uh, talk to each other is, I think, the, uh, uh, the thing that I want to keep in, this, in our post-COVID-19 world. And I appreciate very much your insight and uh, it's very encouraging the way you see things. So let's make it happen. Yes, we'll work together, Dr. Absolutely. Bowden. Hope to see you soon, in person. Indeed, in person, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. Right. Good talking to you.